You are listening to Talking Images, the official podcast of icmforum.com. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Chris, and today we have something a little bit strange for you. We'll actually talk about films we haven't seen. Why not we do that? And what's the value of this? Well, for one, in the last episode, we discovered that Saul has not yet seen Seven Samurai. And I want an episode where we could shame him for 40 minutes to an hour. But it goes a little bit deeper than that. There is actually a lot of psychology and preferences going into what we see and what we don't. And today we'll look into the latter. We will explore why we choose not to see certain films and perhaps why we actively avoid them. We will also dive a little bit deeper into our viewing habits and see if anything changed over the years in terms of what we choose to see and what we don't. And to end it on a little bit of a controversial note, we will tell you about some films we're actually really happy we haven't seen. Clem, Saul, and Tom are back once again, and for the very first time, I'm also extremely happy to introduce Ole. And Ole can introduce himself and also answer my very first question. What is the main reason why I will not see a film, especially if that film in some way is notable? Take it away, Ole. Yeah, so I'm Ole Jonni. I am 32 years old, from Norway originally. I first pursued a career in biology, but decided to move into cinema studies, and I'm currently doing my second year of PhD in cinema studies in Stockholm. What's the main reason I will not see a film? For me, I will actively try to avoid films by directors who are under some kind of uh, criminal controversy, let's say. <laughs> For example, Roman Polanski it has less to do with a sort of uh, activist behavior from my side. Today on Twitter, you have things like cancel culture and so on. But uh, for me, it's more to do with that it will color my viewing of it too much, knowing that their director is under some kind of controversy in the media. So I feel like it's not fair to film a lot of cloud hanging over it. I did actually watch the most recent landscape film, I Accuse, in the cinema before COVID-19 happened. And I really regretted it. I could not see that film as anything other than always me commentary, putting himself as a victim. But there is, of course, so much more to that film, especially the acting and staging. But I just struggle to enjoy it. So I feel, for me at least, that I must wait until the dust has settled. Fans are moving so fast, it becomes history quite fast. So I guess I'll be able to enjoy films by Blonsky or UCK or maybe even Woody Allen in a few years. Well, this does one question though. How are you reacting to older Polanski films? Do you rewatch them or do you just avoid them as well? Yeah, I avoid them as well because I, um, I, I just think of, oh, there's maybe some evidence, something in their personality or psyche or uh, I do avoid that as well. Clem, tell us why you will not watch a film. Uh, hey everyone, my name is Clement. I'm 25 from France. Now, I think it's an interesting question. Well, obviously asked it myself, and I realized that there were not very much reason I would avoid uh, watching a film. I started asking myself also the question, why would I watch a film? And realized that the reason why I would watch a film and the reason why I wouldn't watch a film are very similar and mostly the same. There are two main reasons I came up with. The first one being the director. My reasons are a little bit different than all it. I'm not really interested in the private life, let's say, and the many affairs that could surround someone. I prefer to focus on what he's doing as an art form, and this goes for films, and but also for music, books, and so on. But I can def- definitely understand someone experience being tainted by what's going on in his personal life. Director, well, it's simply if I enjoyed or didn't enjoy a film or films by uh, someone, it will influence my choice. The second reason I came up with is, well, simply the story. If the story doesn't appear to me at all, uh, it will influence my choice of seeing it or not seeing it. Tom? It's Tom here from England. So the main reason you will not see a film, for me, this is quite an interesting one because I feel like I've got a high tolerance for watching adds to average films perhaps because i love the horror genre and films that fall into that category 
obviously, aside from the great ones. So because I'm quite a forgiving viewer, there's not much that I tend to avoid. But the main reason that I would not see a film is probably because of Adam Sandler. If he's in a film, then chances are I'm not going to touch it at all. There are actually two exceptions to this. There's always an exception to a rule because he was brilliant in Uncut Gems and Punch Drunk Love. But I find that his roles in comedies where he just recycles the same character, they really don't work for me. And it's kind of depressing to see him perform so well in these excellent serious roles, but not do them so often because I feel that there's a great actor lurking in there. But so often he just tends to deliver these awful comedies that are obviously successful for him, but it's a shame that he's not focusing on an aspect of his career that's one that I appreciate. Uh, that, that's actually a fantastic commentary too, Tom, because I, I think you're completely right there. I also avoid Adam Sandler in almost anything, but it seems like he has this urge that just once a decade or twice a decade, he wants to prove that he's a good actor and he does it. Like we can go back to Punch and Club, we can also see Rain Over Me, which wasn't as good, but at least he rendered a really high quality performance. And of course, again, with Uncut Gem, which honestly, I would say it's, it might be the best performance of last year. It was just a spectacular performance so yeah adam sandler a genuinely great actor but usually absolutely terrible and i suppose the person to conclude our opening round sal was also the person who started all of this so defend yourself sal why have you not yet seen seven samurai i'm sal i'm 33 years old from australia I've been watching films for 19 years while somehow managing to avoid seven samurai before I get to that, I just thought I might react to some of the other comments from other people. I thought it was interesting about Polanski and what was mentioned about Woody Allen and other directors because, like Clem, I try and see films separately to the directors. I'm able to really divorce myself from their private life while watching it. If I do see their private life come through it, I actually find it more intriguing. Like a lot of Polanski's films are very paranoia related for a good reason. And I think he just creates great paranoia films because of, I guess, stuff that um, has happened to him personally. Uh, Adam Sandler, yeah, I actually like him as an actor in general. I think he does go for a lot of bottom fodder roles. He doesn't show off his potential. But it's not just Uncut Gems and Punch Drug Love and Rain Over Me. I'm thinking of films like Spanglish, which he did around 16 years ago. Very strong performance in that. And even in films like Can't Mess With The Zohan, he's got a very dynamic personality. He's actually channeling Sacha Baron Cohen a bit in that film. I think he's got a lot of potential there, but it just gets squandered over, I guess, the stuff which has made box office draw. And I recently saw 50 First Dates with him in it, which I guess he's playing much of the same character as usual, but I thought it was actually a surprisingly decent film. I don't want this to be a whole Adam Sandler rant conversation. So getting back to why I wouldn't watch films, uh, the main thing I'd actually put down is subject matter. Besides for Seven Samurai, which I haven't watched yet because I'm not really into samurai films, I'm just thinking of films like 127 Hours by Danny Boyle, with James Franco in it, stuck with his arm in the side of the cliff or mountain. I'm thinking, well, why do I actually want to see that? I sort of know what will happen. I've been told what happens in it. Why do I want to watch that for 90 to 120 minutes? Also films like Amour by Michael Haneke. It's one of my favorite directors, but just knowing what the film's about, you know, caring for this old dying woman. Again, it's something which I don't think I would get much enjoyment or pleasure or fulfillment out of seeing. And just some other stuff also like Act of Killing about celebrating different ways of killing or Birth of the Nation, the 1915 film about um, highlighting the achievements of the KKK. Um, the subject matter really gets to me. But big killer would be subject matter plus length. Seven Samurai, it's about samurais, which doesn't interest me. And it's close to four hours long. I'm in there. Sorry, guys. Another reason why I might avoid films is if I know the ending or know the twist something like the crying game i know one of the pivotal twists on there so i haven't actually seen that and on that note though there are some films like white heat 
films like Thelma and Louise that actually do get enhanced if you do know the ending. But generally, if I know the ending, one or twist to come, it's really hard to motivate myself to watch the film. Also, if I haven't seen the original film in a while, or sometimes wouldn't actually want to sit down and see it like Bride of Frankenstein. I haven't seen that yet because I haven't seen the original Frankenstein in 15 years or something like Jean Go Unchained by Quentin Tarantino. I actually avoided for years because I actually thought it was related to the original Jean Go film. It wasn't until I realized that it wasn't that I actually did end up watching it. I'm curious, you say you're avoiding samurai films. What about martial art films or action films in general? Is there something about samurai films that sort of uninteresting to you or yeah i'm not sure i'm not sure what it is about samurai films i've never been big into the action genre in general so in the last couple of years i've really got into kung fu and martial arts films which are very kinetic and there's lots of you know hand-to-hand combat but general action films like with guns and shooting and all that i've never really been much of a fan of never really seen the artistry in that i've never really captivated me that much so i guess i've just got a really slow progress along in terms of action films and maybe i'll get to samurai films eventually i mean you know i've seen a few and other than yojimbo which i know is a kurosawa film other than that none of them have really done much for me so far just to follow up to that though uh, do you like western films oh, okay that's interesting because we've got the westerns challenge going on on the uh, forum at the moment and i've been seeing a lot of really lousy b-grade westerns yeah, westerns. There are definitely some I like a lot. Some, you know, I like less. So, no more, no less than the average genre out there. Samurai and westerns are essentially they're set in like the, the, the characteristics are so similar that major samurai films, including Seven Samurai and Yimbo, got large western remakes because the teams, the types of conflicts and the type of characters and, and the scenarios and the worlds they're in, in, in so many ways overlap. So it's just interesting that you like one more or less the same as other genres, but the other not at all. Well, I don't know really about Westerns. I have got into them much more recently in the past three or four years during participating in the challenges on the ICM forum. But uh, before registering with the ICM forum, I probably wouldn't have seen more than maybe 50 or 80 Westerns. I've seen over 200, so I've become exposed to it more in recent years. So maybe it's just something that I'm gradually catching up with. And I suppose I also have to answer this question. And it's a little bit of a hard one because I am a bit of a completist at heart. So let, let, if you look at recent films from any given year, I will usually try to watch all the films that in some way have received recognition. Uh, and then we just have to look at what degree of recognition. So you have like the films that pop up on almost every single top 10 list. Like regardless of what I believe I'll feel about the film, I will watch it simply because I want to be part of that conversation. I want to discuss those films. And I also think it's really interesting to go into a film I don't necessarily like, but to be able to dissect why I didn't like it and be able to also discuss that with other people. But, but then there's also a drop-off rate, in which case it will usually be the director. So if I've had experience with that director and I know that director it's not that interesting to me. I will usually avoid that film, or usually at least not see that film. Un- unlike Ola, I don't really struggle to divide art from artists, so I will still see recent films by Polanski, and I would have seen recent films from Woody Allen if they weren't so poor. So if I l- at one point loved the director, I would always be interested to follow that director, see what they did in the beginning, and see how they end, and just follow that journey. But some directors, Woody Allen in particular just seem to slow down the overall quality of their output. It, it, just, it just don't feel particularly good. Like, I, I guess so one of his recent ones with Jesse Eisenberg and uh, Kristen Stewart. I don't even remember its name anymore. And it, it, it's Society. Once the, yes, yes, exactly. Cafe Society. And it's just so false. Like, it's just so... And, and that can be good. Like, you can have this false a strange vision of a time that can work really, really well. But here it just felt largely empty. There's some good humor there. There's some things that work, but it just doesn't feel like the work of a great director. That's usually why I drop off these days. Chris, have you seen Irrational Man by Woody Allen? It came out a year before Cafe Society. 
slowed down watching Woody Allen film after Blue Jasmine. So I think I've only seen one or two of his films after that. Before that, I've seen absolutely everything. But after that, I just realized that he wasn't really making films that were that interesting anymore. Okay, because Irrational Man's actually an extremely interesting film. It's all about morality, about what you can get away with. It follows a lot of his recurring themes um, from Times and Misdemeanors through to Match Point through to Scoop with a lot of things about ethics. It's an extremely interesting film with a really great performance by Joaquin Phoenix in it, and I would highly recommend it. And I would still see more modern Alan films, even though it's a bit uneven. I found the last 10 years he does one great film, then one not so great film. But I'd say every second film he does or has been doing lately has actually been really good. That's a good recommendation, though. I'll definitely seek out The Rational Man. Another thing that's really changed for me is that I used to be far more interested in the broader social conversations of films as well. So I would often watch essentially anything that would would be of note, like, like including Transformers or including all of the recent top blockbusters, simply so I could also discuss those films. And I think that over the years, especially as I got less and less time to see films, I just started to become increasingly picky. And that also ties into, say, Academy Award nominations, where I actually didn't see Green Book until a couple of months ago, and that won the award, simply because the new Green Book was not a film that would be overly interesting to me. So I think that's also one thing that's changed in my viewing habits, that I've just been, become a bit more picky, and I don't feel like I need to participate in every single conversation, even though I'm still a bit of a completist. This ties us into the next topic as well, how have your viewing habits changed? same pattern that we did earlier so starting with Ula, then clem then tom and then sol and just answer the question how has your viewing habits changed if they have i've never been uh, into oscar some blockbusters and things like that but i i did go down that route of uh, trying to be top 50 and i found the makers that my took my interest and then i delved into them Last few years, I've been less focused on narrative cinema. It has become less important to me. I've grown increasingly fond of experimental films or films that focus on moments or feelings, trying to test what the film is and what it is capable of. Clem? My viewing habits have never really changed over the years. I think, as we mentioned before, when people got into cinema, well, at least when we did, we started working on the IMDb Top 250 and for some maybe started watching the most popular film, the biggest films of the year, as Chris uh, mentioned. For me, I was never particularly interested in uh, checking out those films. I do check them out occasionally, but uh, most of the time it's not the film that appealed to me the most and I always find there are some other films I'm more interested in. So I tend to watch them, but usually years later, and some, some of them I've never seen to this day, which I think we'll discuss later on. So overall, uh, I think when people try to keep up with what's popular and Academy Awards or in the general public, it's also because they want to, well, be able to discuss cinema with people around them. I never really felt this need and never really had the opportunity either in real life, I mean, until the ICM forum. Keeping up was never really something I tried to do. Thanks, Clem. Tom? So, unlike Clem, I think that my viewing priorities have changed somewhat. I used to try to keep up with new releases like Chris did. Basically, in my early 20s, I used to review films for a few outlets. And I kind of had it in my head that to be a a well-rounded critic, I wanted to see the majority of the new releases and keep in touch with what was popular in, in mainstream cinema. As I moved away from that, I decided to pursue primarily areas of film I specifically enjoy. So obviously horror is one of my main priorities and I now tend to focus on completing lists like the lists on I Check Movies where I know that the quality of films is going to be of a, a certain level that will be satisfactory to my viewing habits as opposed to keeping up with the mainstream blockbusters which are entertaining and have their place and I do still seek out the ones that interest me but not so much as I used to. Thanks Tom. So 
So my viewing habits have changed quite significantly over the nearly two decades that I've been watching films. So probably similar to Tom, I would have started from one point where it was more mainstream films, more so, I guess, the bigger films. Then I would have branched out from there. So I first started off by using Hollywell's Film Guide. I would go and try and find the three and the four star films available. Some of the holes that I have in my movie viewing, not so much Seven Samurai, but things like Robert Bresson films, are because those I'll never, I was never able to get in my early years as a cinema goer. Over time, my taste has also narrowed down a bit. Like Tom, I'm really into horror. Like all, I actually am interested in experimental cinema, not stuff like Dog Star Man, Stan Brackage. I actually really can't stand that. But the structuralist filmmakers are Hollis Frampton, Michael Snow. I really like some of the stuff they've done. So since my film taste has actually narrowed over the last 19 years, it's got to the point where, yes, we've got these Robert Bresson films available to me now, but now I'm no longer interested in seeing that. I'm interested in seeing more horror films. I'm interested in seeing or um, personal identity films. I'm interested in seeing more dramas where you're not sure whether somebody's seeing something is real or not. My tastes have changed, and because my tastes have changed, my viewing priorities have changed, and I think that's why I've got a lot of the things which I've avoided, because when I was first getting into cinema, I was never able to experience them then, and now it's like, well, I could experience them now, or I could actually watch some horror films, which I know I'm really going to like, and which I'm really curious to actually check out. Well, thank you, Saul, and I guess that destroys our hope of, of a Robert Preston podcast as well. <laughs> so... This takes us on to the probably most fun question in today's podcast. So, Saul has entered a territory a little bit already of which films we're a little bit embarrassed that we haven't seen yet. So, if you don't have any films you're actually embarrassed of, you can simply name some of the films that you feel that you probably should have seen already. And we can start from Clem again. As I mentioned earlier, my viewing habits haven't really changed over the years, and I've well, I've never really been interested in keeping up with the most popular films. So the biggest uh, holes, let's say, in my viewing experience are the films that are well, the most popular, the box office films that everyone has seen, which is quite a problem because it's becoming tougher to talk about films or even say that you, you like films when you meet someone for the first time uh, because usually they'll ask you about films and be like yeah I haven't seen that one I haven't seen that one I haven't seen that one and yeah they probably and most of the time they're just wondering why why you call yourself you know movie loving if you haven't uh, seen all the Marvel films stuff like that well not that I'm ashamed of not having seen them of course but it's a conversation killer let's say the biggest films I haven't seen are the most cult popular films from the 90s. I wrote down a few, Dirty Dancing, Dancing with Wolves, uh, The Mask, Jumanji, like big popular films from the 90s that I never really watched when I was a kid or a teenager and that now, well, don't, don't really appear to me. Uh, there are also a lot of uh, the recent Oscar winners that I haven't seen. I think the most recent one I've seen must have been Birdman, which I actually liked. There are also, of course, all the all-time box office biggest hit I haven't uh, seen. And I think the film I'm the most ashamed of not having seen, despite having seen the first one, the second one, and the fourth one, is Shrek 3. <laughs> so Shrek 3 is the film you're most embarrassed to see. Okay, let's uh, continue the conversation. Over to Ula. I'm teaching film in university, and I think it's two films for me. One is The Birds. Alfred Hitchcock film because constantly referenced in film literature. And the same with uh, Umberto D, the Vittorio De Sica film, especially the scene with the maid making coffee, constantly being referenced by film theorists such as Rea Bassan and Gilles De Luz. Or when it comes to the birds, I have this mental image that it is a very annoying film to listen to, teaching of sounds of birds that are up to new good and from people i've heard talking about it uh, they have said that it's a bit of a disappointing hitchcock film however i have for some reason on time in my life to watch the terrible copycat uh, birdemic one of the worst films i've ever seen but for some reason i've seen birdemic and not birds so that makes it even more shameful 
And let's just put it like this, the noises those birds make are far more annoying. That is, that is good to hear. I should, I should definitely try to make time for the birds. But also, I'm, better D, uh, I'm, I'm sure I like the films. I don't think you're really missing out on much with the birds as a narrative. The narrative is actually highly unsatisfying. I've found, I've seen it a couple of times, maybe three times. It doesn't really resolve anything, doesn't provide any answers. As an exercise in editing, though, it's actually really great. If you actually break it down to the reaction shots and the way Hitchcock cuts to the birds and cuts back to the lead actress's face and then back again, sets up lots of tension. I've actually used it myself or storyboards from it when I've taught um, editing at a very basic primary school level. But it's a good film from that point of view technically, but I think as a narrative, you're not really missing out on a lot. I wouldn't give it, wouldn't make it one of Hitchcock's top 10 films or anything. I don't want to slag off the birds too much because I did actually think it was a great film. I have rewatched it and it wasn't as strong on the rewatch as it was the original viewing, probably because on the original viewing I was more caught up in the atmosphere, which is really, really well done. So I agree with Saul completely that the narrative is not fantastic, but as you know, a well-crafted film, it does really well. It also has a lot of mystery and a lot of tension that I think is even made stronger by the fact that it's not really resolved. Asking a question regarding Umberto D, uh, is there a particular reason why you haven't seen it yet since you're so embarrassed that you haven't seen it? Have you seen other films by Vittoria De Sica and not enjoyed them, or is there another reason? I've seen other films by the director, and I, I mean, Bicycle Thieves is a masterpiece. I think, I think it's just that I have this mental image of the scene with the maid making coffee so clearly in my mind that I'm, I'm worried that when I see it, that I won't think much of it. I've not seen that many uh, neorealist uh, films in the last few years. I, I'm guessing it's time for to curate for me for myself some program and watch more of them, including uh, Berto D. And I think you'll really enjoy it too because it's it, I mean it's not about the maid. It's it, it's probably one of the most depressing films ever made with just an incredible central performance and a really cute dog, which will also make you feel very sad. But let, let's take this conversation over to Tom. So for me, the film I'm most embarrassed for not seeing is probably an Akira Kurosawa film, The Hidden Fortress. Now, I love all the other Kurosawa films that I've seen. For some reason, I've just never got round to this one. And funny that this is the one that I haven't seen because I know that the storyline was a huge inspiration for George Lucas on Star Wars and when I was growing up, Star Wars was one of my favourite films. So really, this should be a, a high priority for me. But as is the case with so many films, they often just slip through the cracks and, and you forget about them. But hopefully I will get around to watching this someday soon. I think it's a really interesting result of not I've seen. And just my personal view of it, even though I think it's a great film, is that it's probably one of his lightest as well. It doesn't really have the clout or the heaviness or the c- cinematic prowess of, say, Rashomon or Seven Samurai, etc. But it's definitely well worth a viewing. And that leads us on to Saul. I thought this was a really interesting question when Chris put it out before. He up to the episode, he wanted us to think about films that were embarrassed about never having seen. I don't know if I'd ever quite use that word. Like I mentioned previously or earlier on in the podcast, there's films that I just haven't seen because maybe they weren't available to me when I was first getting into cinema. And now I've sort of refined my taste a lot. So there's films that I just naturally haven't picked up and haven't gotten around to. It does sometimes get a bit awkward in conversations, especially when people know you're in real life, know that you've seen eight or 9,000 films, know that you like movies a lot and they mention something. And I have to go, oh, well, I've never seen Braveheart, for instance, or something like that. So you can always get a little bit awkward, but there's always, I find, a reason for me. Uh, like I said earlier on with some of the films I mentioned, like A More by Michael Hanukkah, and how I look at that and go, well, it's going to be like really sad and depressing. I don't want to see that. I don't want to see James Franco hanging off a mountain for um, hours, trying to get his arm off before he does you-know-what with it. So I'd say it's not quite embarrassing for me. It's more the case of it does sometimes lead to a little bit of awkwardness. But then a lot of people, I guess, don't really realize how many films there are out there. 
especially who are really into cinema, really until it comes up in conversation and ever becomes an issue. And then just look at how broad cinema is at the moment and just all the different other avenues to explore. I could just go through the uh, They Shoot Pictures Top 1000, or I could actually go exploring off uh, niche bits of African cinema or Latin American cinema, as I've done for the ICM Forum Challenges, and I'd rather be doing that than going through one particular list. I think that it's funny you mention the awkward conversations with people that presume that you see most of the popular films there, Sol, because I had one the other day where one of my friends was asking for my thoughts on the new uh, Godzilla film, and then they were surprised that I didn't have any because I hadn't seen it, and we were all so surprised that I hadn't seen the previous incarnation, and then were dumbfounded that the only one I had seen was the 1954 original. Yeah, I'd agree with that a lot, Tom. I find also with things like Marvel movies, people talk to me about that, I'm like, well, I haven't actually seen anything other than Guardians of the Galaxy because the rest of it doesn't look particularly good. Though I know there's stuff like Thor Ragnarok, which is from the director of um, Jojo Rabbit. And when I was first talking about Jojo Rabbit, the person next to me was saying, oh, what's well, from the director of that Thor movie? I'm like, oh, I well, know it's from the director of What We Do in the Shadows or The Hunt for the Wilder People, but I don't really associate with those sort of bigger films i watched most of the marvel film. you are not missing out on anything at all i watch them so that when people ask me about them i have some usually it's quite negative something else i've put out there some people do like to call me a film snob for not watching certain films the way they look at it is that there's thousands and thousands of films out there it's come to this stage in the journey. I've been watching films for 19 years. I know what's likely to appeal to me more, and I would much rather focus on that at the moment. But, you know, probably got at least another 19 years ahead of me, and during that time, things might change. You know, it's interesting. So like you said, you're not embarrassed uh, about any of the films you haven't seen, because at least there's one film, if not the whole the film, that I'm really, really genuinely embarrassed I haven't gotten around to yet, and that is Twin Peaks The Return. And, and I, just, I don't have any excuse for that because I love David Lynch and I love Twin Peaks. And I remember when waiting for it ever since it was announced and preparing to start watching it when it was coming on TV. And it wasn't shown in my, my country at the time. So I decided to wait until, you know, it was all done and I could see all of it in one go. And then I didn't. And I still haven't. And besides being, I guess, around 17 hours long, I just don't have any excuse for that whatsoever. And another relatively longer miniseries that I know I should get around to is Mysteries of Lisbon, which you know keeps just topping end of the decade lists and it's just so respected among so many people. And you know, I see the screenshots and it looks genuinely beautiful. And again, this is just a case of it's relatively long and I just don't have that close a connection to the films of the director. So I would say those are probably the two most embarrassing films for me. Oh, and, and I just remembered one more, which is Winter Sleep. That's again, just because I haven't seen a lot of Zealand films. As I haven't seen Climates, I haven't seen The Wild Pear Tree. Uh, and that's probably one of the major directors I really, really need to see more films from. I don't think you're missing out on too much with Mysteries of Lisbon. It does look really gorgeous. It's a gorgeous looking film. I found it a real chore to get through. And I can't quite remember why I watched it in the first place, but it was definitely not as good as I was hoping it to be. I would say you are definitely missing out on uh, Peaks The Return. You have to watch it. Uh, is, is it, are you worried that your expectations are too high? Is that a reason why you haven't watched it yet? It, it might be. It might be part of it, but like, I, I just, I, I don't know. I, 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 I think I'm pretty convinced I will love it. I'm pretty damn convinced I love it. So if, while that might play a tiny part of it, I really just think it's just setting aside those 17 hours. They just need to start doing that right away. The one thing I did think was interesting earlier in this conversation is the IMDb Top 250. Because in the very first episode, we all talked about how massive the IMDb Top 250 was in getting us into films. I mean, most of us repeated it in this episode as well. Yet I think that list has dropped in most of our appreciation. So I think it would be really, really fun if we all opened that list up and 
just check quickly how many films we haven't seen from that yet. So I used to be proud of completing the IMDb top 250 and would actually try and watch every new film that entered it. But my viewing habits have changed. It's become less of a priority. So for me, it's now at 235 of the films that I've seen. And there's 15 unchecked and mainly new releases, Hollywood films that have entered over the past few years. It's actually almost identical number to me. So I have 334 films checked and it's pretty much the same thing. New releases that I just didn't get around to, including one that's actually quite shocking, which I know I should have seen, which is Room. I guess I should add that to the list of films I'm embarrassed to not have seen yet as well. I've seen 202 out of 250 of the current IMDb Top 250. I don't know if it's actually a list that I was ever too interested in getting into cinema. I mean, I did refer to and look at it a little bit, but I think I guess from early on, I already knew that it was always had a few suspect choices in there. But it's interesting that people complain about a lot of these suspect choices these days, but some of them are actually really good. There's a recent Spanish film in there called The Invisible Guest, which actually is really good. It's not 250 of all time good, but, you know, either is American History X or other films that are in there. And even things like Three Idiots, okay, it's not one of the top 250 films ever made, but it actually is a really funny film with a lot of heart to it also. I've not seen our, uh, the Indian uh, blockbusters and a lot of films that have uh, been popular uh, Oscar nominees. I haven't you bothered about watching them. It's skeptical to at least nowadays. I guess that makes me a bit of a sob. I suppose we're all snobs now. Yeah, yeah. I, I do want to uh, try one of those uh, blockbusters just to see what it's like. I've heard or read several critics. Uh, seems to be maybe we all find some good on this list. I've seen 202 films out of 250 right now, just like Sol. Despite uh, being the first list I worked on, I actually never completed it. It's something I was planning to do, but I never really got around to, to doing it. I think it's uh, one of my long-term goals to one time at least uh, have platinum on, on this list, but uh, never really got around to it so far. But well, that was an interesting trip down memory lane, wasn't it? I remember also working on this list so much. I, I think if I go to my MD profile, I'll see, you know, the little mini trophy for, you know, checked 2004 list, checked 2005 list, checked 2006 list. And at some point, it just started being too many films on that list that I just didn't really have a massive interest for and was even a bit averse to. And then slowly, I stopped working on it. But tying us over to the our Second to last topic, which is what are some films that you avoided watching or, or waited to watch for a very, very long time and was then just blown away and incredibly pleasantly surprised and just couldn't believe you had waited so long to finally see. And we can start with Clem. Well, I don't know if I should be speaking about this one because I uh, tried to think about it and I couldn't find any films. I think this shows a man with a sense of priority. So, well done, Clem. <laughs> Thanks. Ola? Paul mentioned earlier that he did not buy uh, Stan Breckage. I would say there are two films by Stan Breckage that I put off for the longest time because of their content. They are about one is Window Water Baby Moving, going up close to the birth of his daughter. And the other one is the act of seeing with one's own eyes, filming autopsy org. Put off these films because I was worried I could not handle seeing these things on camera. They, they seemed like very difficult films. I'm so glad I chose to see them uh, earlier this year. I had in them on list writings for close to a decade. I, I just found them very beautiful. Especially Window Water Baby Moving, which, is, which I found a very touching film on birth. I also found that both films really brought home ID by Stan Brackage of the values of looking for the untutored eye. And so his idea is that when we look at something, we act instinctively by grouping it, we already know. We think of birth as something a bit more romantic and less messy. Uh, but this sorting mechanism in our brain probably tries to yield some images away from us. It teaches us not to look at birth and death in such a way as in these two films by Brackage. Earth as well as that is more beautiful in our heads, perhaps. Earth and autopsies are real things uh, that are in a way harder to look at. 
actually these films they are silent to focus on seeing they are not only beautiful but they also show something of not being afraid of these aspects for example in act of seeing with one's own eyes that seeing there is the daily life of some people that are doing autopsies but i think also what i got out of these things that i've been dreading for so long to watch i think it's so interesting that we bring up both of these two films because I also waited with seeing them, not necessarily because of their contents, but just because I had some less pleasant experiences with Stan Wreckage. I'm not a particularly big fan of Dog Star Man, for instance, and that put me off seeing some of his longer shorts for a long time, but both of these two films instantly became favorites for me. I thought I'd just mention with uh, Window Water Baby moving that I did actually have seen that and I did like it. I think it's quite different to something like Dog Star Man because you've got a real sense of things going on there. It's just the randomness of Dog Star Man that really put me off and has put me off some of the other Brackage films that I've seen. And that's why I was saying I prefer something like um, Zorn's Lemma or Wavelength in terms of experimental cinema because it seems to have a purpose and it's actually doing something. Wavelength is more of a structural experiment, yes, and it has a, a bit of a narrative. I, I love Michael Snow, so talk about that on another podcast sometime. And and I would say that although Wreckage is in theory more playful, like he, he is a playful film, like he plays with the celluloid. Michael Snow is more funny, I would say. He's a, quite a funny filmmaker. Yeah, I agree about Snow's films being very funny, especially so is this, the one we just see one word every one second, every two seconds. That's incredibly funny. Things like Corpus Colossum, where he's constantly putting like film form on its head. Uh, it's also, yeah, very funny. And yeah, I found all of Michael Snow's films to be extremely playful. Uh, even stuff like Back and Forth, where it keeps going back and forth and suddenly you see something different. This really toys and plays with our expectations as a film goer, and I've really liked that about what I've seen from his work. That's a great discussion, and we can move it on to what films Tom is embarrassed he hasn't yet seen. One of the films that I held out for the longest was Open Your Eyes by Alejandro Amenabar. Now, the reason for this was the fact that I saw Vanilla Sky, the remake, quite early uh, film-watching experiences, and it didn't really resonate with me. I was kind of disappointed that it had been hyped up by some people um, close to me to be this great thing that it perhaps wasn't. And for that reason, I decided that the original was not worth seeking out. Now, I watched it um, only a few months back and it blew me away. I thought it was a masterful head trip, uh, perhaps even the director's greatest accomplishment. It tangles with notions of reality, dreams of immortality and perceptions of identity to deliver one hell of an enigma. It, it channels the trauma and paranoia of uh, John Frankenheimer's seconds with a uh, bold narrative flourish, perhaps not too far removed from the mind-bending approach Christopher Nolan applied to storytelling in Memento. And it leaves you longing to revisit the film once you've uncovered all the secrets contained within its perplexing yet wholly satisfying labyrinthine storyline and for me that was a great experience that I, I kind of wish I'd, I'd seen earlier but at the same time I was so happy that I did eventually decide to seek it out. Interestingly I had a similar experience to Tom with Vanilla Sky and Open Your Eyes. I saw Vanilla Sky very close to when it came out probably in 2002 or 2003 it was a big film that time. It got, I think, an Oscar nomination for Best Song and a SAG nomination for Acting. So it was quite a big film there. When I actually saw Vanilla Sky, it actually did, to my young mind back then, I guess I was 15 or 16, it did kind of blew me away a little bit. And because of that, I actually avoided Open Your Eyes for at least 10 years after that. By the time I actually sat down and watched Open Your Eyes, because it actually had been so long, I did like it quite a bit more than I was expecting to. But it's just interesting that I avoided it for the exact same reason I ended up avoiding it. And so to throw in that, I just now realized that, yeah, I still haven't seen Open Your Eyes. And yes, I am quite embarrassed not to have seen it yet. Nice throwback to the last topic. That takes us on to Saul. I think our current topic is about films that we've avoided, but we're happy that we finally saw them. 
And one of them, going back to our podcast from last week, we were all delighted about how much we loved A Clockwork Orange, its influence on our lives. I saw A Clockwork Orange at a quite tender age of, I remember it was about 15 or 16, and the film Singing in the Rain from A Clockwork Orange and associating with that scene, I was like, I don't think I can ever see Singing in the Rain. I actually didn't until very recently, I'd say maybe about six or seven years ago, actually finally sat down and saw Singing in the Rain and liked it a lot. And I've watched it many times since, and I think I've actually seen it five times now, which is a lot over a six or seven year period. I think it's good though that I avoided Singing in the Rain and I didn't see it early on in my film going journey because it's about silent films and silent cinema. And before registering with the ICM forum, I'd probably only seen maybe 30 or 40 silent films. Uh, in the time since, I've seen a lot and a lot and a lot more. And when I first was getting into cinema, the only silent films that I knew about were Nosferatu and I think Metropolis. I think had I seen Singing in the Rain with only those two films as my background, I don't think I would have liked it so much. So I think it was actually good that I avoided it for a few years. And seeing more silent films made, has made me appreciate it more, what's going on there from a narrative point of view. Another film which I also avoided for quite a while for a reason which I haven't mentioned yet. One of my reasons why I also sometimes avoid films is because if they seem gimmicky. So I know that's not really a great reason, but things like Boyhood from Richard Linklater, I still haven't seen that. I'm like, it just seems, you know, the gimmick that's going to film a little bit here, there and there. Another film which always struck me as very gimmicky was Dogville from Lars von Trier. And it first came out in 2003. It was discussed a lot on the IMDb message boards. The von Trier films that I'd seen back then were films like The Idiots, which I thought was fairly idiotic, I'm sorry to say. So that was one was like, oh, okay, a film without sets, yeah, whatever, doesn't really interest me. It's only recently, in the last six months, I've actually sat down and liked Dogville. And I liked it, and it was really interesting having it with no sets in there. And I'm very pleased that I saw it. But also in the time since then, I've seen a lot more Von Trier films. I've things, seen things like The House That Jack Built, Tropa. I've seen a lot of other things that Von Trier has done, which I think has also helped me seeing that with a little bit of a delay. But it's just interesting as another film that I did avoid for quite a bit, but I'm very happy that I finally saw. I just want to add there that Dogville is also one of my very favorite films. I would love to discuss that one at more length. At the later point, does anyone else want to say anything uh, about this topic? It's quite interesting that Adam, who is a producer, one of the co-producers of this podcast, as well as the person who set up the forum, has actually told me before that he's watched Boyhood specifically because of the gimmick. So some film goers, I guess, are attracted by gimmicks; others are put off by them. It's just really interesting just in the whole scope of why we might avoid a film or why we might go to, out of our way to see a film. I think Boyhood works well because of the gimmick. I mean, the actual story it tells is very straightforward and would have been perfectly passable, perfectly good film on its own. But I think when you know more about the project and how much went into it, then also see how each section in the story was more or less organically written as a project over so many years, it adds more to it and makes it better. So this is probably one of the one of the few films in my mind where the gimmick in many ways makes it a more interesting project in, in its own right. The film that I want to present today as a film that just blew me away. It's also a film that ties in with a podcast that is coming out soon. It's not our next one, but the one right after that, which is our podcast on Eric Romer's Comedies and Proverbs cycle, The Aviator's Wife. And this is a film that just took me years and years and years to get around to. And the reason for that is that up until this point, Romer was a rather hit and miss director for me. I loved some of his films, but others just didn't work on that level because it, I wasn't on his wavelength. I didn't quite understand what he was trying to do. And, and I suppose I even had this idea that David Ritter's wife was about David Ritter's wife and was and was a film about some a marriage of a kind. I just didn't have any interest in the film. I didn't know anything about the film. And because I didn't have a close relationship to Romer, I never really cared to look into it. But then I saw it. And ironically, this is the film that just opened up Romer for me completely. I felt that I got sucked into what he was trying to do, the multiple levels his film works, both as satire and comedy, 
and as commentary and all of the things finally came together for me, including the way he stylizes his films. And it also set me on a journey to watch as many Romer films as I could. And yeah, that this is the film that literally opened up Romer and made me love Eric Romer. So it's, it's probably the major, wow, why didn't I see that before film in my life? Or perhaps it just came around at the, at the right time in my life as well. Perhaps this was the time when my taste had changed until I was on Romer's wavelength. I mean, you, you never know either way, but th that was such an interesting view to me. And I've seen so many other Romer's since, and almost all of them were films I either loved or thought were great. So I, I just want to thank that film for doing that for me. <laughs> Not actually seeing The Aviator's Wife, but hearing you talk about it so passionately does inspire me to watch it. Um, so that's another one that perhaps I put off a long time that may hopefully blow me away. I've seen all the films of uh, this cycle by Romer, but it was a few years ago, so I don't remember much from them. But I intend to uh, rewatch them all for the podcast in two weeks. And The Aviator's Wife and The Greenway were the two films of the cycle I preferred. And overall, I like Romer's films, so I really can't wait to... Um, rewatch them all and then discuss them with you guys in two weeks and with that uh, self-promotion out of the way let's take it on to the conclusion here and we actually talk about a couple of films we're really really happy we haven't seen yet and we can take it back to clem just like the other questions i thought about it before uh, making this podcast and well there are films i will probably never see because they do not uh, appeal to me story-wise or because of the way the film is made. I think that the films I'm mostly happy I haven't seen are actually films I know I will enjoy. Films by directors I like or films that really, really appeal to me that I know are there for a special occasion, for you know, a special day or when, whenever I want to watch a good film, I know it's there. Ola. My answer to this question is a bit boring. For me, it's films that I'm waiting for a better copy to be available. Yeah, I was really happy you, you mentioned uh, waiting for films to come out in better quality because that's just what I did with A Brighter Summer Day. So, you know, that, that was around just in this terrible, terrible condition until Criterion got around to restore it. And it just looks beautiful now. So I'm just so happy I waited, say, 10, 12, 13 years when I first heard about it until seeing it because it really paid off. Challenges, of course, sometimes that don't know if there will be a better version. Should you wait two decades, three decades? This obscure film that seems interesting but only exists in PVHS does make a huge difference when films are restored and restored well. Okay, Tom. I'm really happy that I haven't seen is the nine and a half hours documentary about the Holocaust called Shower. Now, I'm going to have to see this at some point because the film appears in the they shoot pictures, don't they, list of the thousand greatest films. But it's one that I've been putting off for quite some time, obviously due to the uh, run length. And as I'm kind of a completist when I watch films, I don't really like watching them in parts. So this would be one where I'd have to sit down and watch it in as close to one sitting as possible, at least in the same day. But for now, I'm going to pass on it and work on the other films on the list because I think it's a, a grueling experience that I'm perhaps not quite ready for yet. That was a, different, a bit of a different angle than I was expecting. So thank you, Tom. It's really interesting that Tom mentioned Shoah, the um, nine-hour Holocaust film, because that's what I look at with film length. And when I'm trying to find a really long film about something that I'm not interested in, I want to be able to give it that three or four hours if need be. I don't often watch films in one sitting, especially if they're really long. And I'm not embarrassed or ashamed by it because it's just like reading a good novel. You can pick it up, do it at another point. But I want to be able to give films that chance. If they do grip me enough, I can sit in one viewing. So something like Show I would like to have the nine hours free to be able to watch it at once. It's not something that I think I would watch in nine hours at once. That's why I was really gripped and really enticed by it. But I'd like to be able to give it that opportunity. In terms of long films, though, that's the first thing that I thought about with the uh, topic of films that we're happy that we've never seen. 
is the number one one that has come up for me is Empire by Andy Warhol. The film a static shot of the um, Empire State Building and apparently a person sleeping. And I've seen a couple of other Warlow films or Warlow Paul Morrissey films and very, very low down in my books. I recently saw Lonesome Cowboys, which is a really terrible film. It's very poorly made. I think it's poorly made on purpose with all the um, audio not properly recorded and all the jump cuts. I think it's on purpose to be subversive. But it's subversive and it lasts for an hour and 45 minutes. So it's like at first it's like, oh, this is really cool. Warhol's defying all these conventions. But by the time you've watched an hour and 45 minutes of it, it's like pulling your hair out seeing that for that long. On that note, I'm happy that I haven't seen Empire. I think it was once in the um, They Shoot Pictures Top 1000. A list that I'm never probably going to get a platinum on anyway and I check movies. So it's a film that I don't need to see. I know some people have seen it because they want to get a platinum on it. Uh, I know some people are suggesting watching it on times seven speed, but uh, I'm not going to do that. It doesn't really seem to me that's a proper way of experiencing a film. I, mean, I, could, not, I could sort of understand it if it's something like a James Benning film, not that I've done that. I mean, usually with a James Benning film, I'll be doing something else at the same time. So I wouldn't just be sitting glued to the screen with that. But uh, yeah, in terms of fast forwarding through films, yeah. I don't think you really get the quite the same experience of it unless it's something where there's maybe no dialogue and no music and no anything. But yeah, it's just not the same as the way the film was intended to be. I think I'm also extremely happy that I haven't seen Empire, to be honest. And I think I was always especially annoyed by its popularity because it wasn't intended to be a standard film. I mean, it, it, it is an art piece that was meant to be just be projected at parties and uh, art shows. You weren't supposed to see all of it. And now so many people are in one way or another forcing themselves to see this film, to read a complete list or to just say, hey, I've seen it. And it is just such a strange, strange thing to do, especially if you watch it on 7x speed. That's just really bizarre. So I, I'm not sure if I, if I ever actually wanted to see it. I don't know. Maybe I'd try to do it as if it was an art show, you know, put it on, project it on the wall or just put it on put it on the TV and just walk around the other stuff. I think this would be the only film I would ever be comfortable doing that to. Like with that James Spending film, I will actually try to be absorbed in it. And I often am, but just Empire, I just, I don't know how to engage with that film or respect it properly, which is why I just haven't seen it yet. It's an interesting point that Chris has mentioned about films and how they're meant to be seen and that Empire was never actually designed to be something where you're going to sit for, you know, a whole day and just completely watch it. Because you've got things like miniseries then. So something like Fanny Alexander, I have watched in a single sitting. If I'm looking at the miniseries version of it, it wasn't actually designed to be experienced that way. So then you go, if you're really a film purist, do you watch a miniseries all at once? Do you break it up? Are they interesting questions? And I'd love to do a podcast on film purism. I know Tom's also interested in that. Uh, it's a topic which I would like to cover at some stage. Say a little bit disappointing you guys here and for a little bit of this because we didn't get, you know, that raunchy, enjoyable feeling of, wow, I haven't seen this. You, you went the much more serious and good route with this. So, so I'll be the petty one then and just say that there are so many films I haven't seen that I am genuinely happy that I have not seen. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, when I was watching the majority of films that you know reached some kind of height, including films like Transformers, like I just want to say I'm so happy I stopped that. I'm so happy I haven't seen Transformers 4, 5, 6, 7, or however far they've gotten into that franchise. I don't even know anymore. And I'm also incredibly happy that I stopped, uh, what the hell is it even called? Oh, yeah, The Hunger Games. I'm incredibly happy I stopped watching The Hunger Games and I haven't seen the last film from that series either. Another series I'm really glad I stopped right away is the Fantastic Beasts series. The first one was just abysmal, and that was just no point in continuing watching that. And in, in terms of slightly more respected films, and, and I know you said some nice words about it, so, so I might actually change my mind on this, but one of the main reasons why I never completed the Iron Beat of the 50 at one point again was because films like Three Idiots were landing on it. And, and I was watching the first few films of this type that were landing there, and I didn't enjoy them at all. And I just used some of these comedies with a lot of suspicion. I'm quite sure I won't enjoy it. Though I, I might be wrong about that. So maybe 
if you ever do a revamp of this episode and say a few years, I'll come back and say, wow, Three Idiots is one film I can't believe I wait so long to see. But I just don't think that will happen. There we go with Three Idiots. You might really like it. I found it surprisingly clever, a film with quite a bit of heart in there. It's about these guys searching for a friend who's gone missing from his university days and his friend's actually quite clever and all these different ways to you know get back at university professors and different bullies in the school and just a very inventive and interesting character and it's just interesting seeing some of the things that they got up to and some of the mischief along the way it reminded me a little bit of maybe the hangover a little bit who's trying to find this lost friend I was really surprised by it, and maybe because I was expecting it to be really serious, I was expecting it to be idiotic. Based on the title, based on the front cover, I uh, really changed my expectations. I mean, it's not one of the 250 best films ever made. Is it one of the top 250 best comedies ever made? I don't know, possibly. I'd say possibly for that one. It definitely is a fairly enjoyable film, and I found it a lot more tolerable than maybe some of the other longer films in the IMDb Top 250. Also, oh, so I might be more open to see it now, even though I'm also not a massive fan of the Hangover franchise. Oh, oh, and just one more franchise that I'm incredibly happy I haven't seen, never saw a single film from, is Twilight. I know that film is dropping from, you know, the public consciousness now, and that that statement won't mean much anymore, but I'm just so, so happy I never got forced into seeing that series. And on that remark, I think we're ready to uh, close everything up here, so... Thank you for listening, and join us again soon. You have been listening to Talking Images, the official podcast of ICMforum.com.